Well, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to thank Ms. Chris for jumping in the media seat today and helping with all the stuff up there. Hopefully that will work. And uh, I got a text from Karen Barnes from India uh, the other day saying, please record this so I can watch it when I get home. So it's kind of cool to text to India, amen? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's good to hear. Father, we just pray for Karen and Alan today. Yeah. We just thank you for the open doors of opportunity that you are giving them. Father, we just uh, bless Pastor Raja and the Andaman Islands. Yes. Father, we just uh, thank you for the boldness for which they are declaring your kingdom as they put their feet on the soil there. Father, we thank you for the intercession that you're going to give them, the prophetic decrees, the unction and the utterances that you're going to give them to decree and declare over that ministry, over that land, over that yes. region. And Father, we join our hearts and the spirit with them today. We thank you for the angels that are accompanying them and ministering with them. And we give you glory for all that is going to be done even before we hear it. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. And everyone say amen. 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 Well, we have a prophetic watch alert that I want to share with you today. Um, I had intended on launching off into our new series, The War of Deliverance, and um, I'm really excited about it, and I already have the first lesson written out and ready to go, and this week, my attention kept getting drawn to some other areas, and so I kept being obedient and just watching and looking into that, and um, as I did, uh, I just felt like there was a shift in the focus for today, so awesome. those that may watch this on YouTube or watching it here today, we just pray that... Um, Father, the Holy Spirit will help you judge this and um, process this as we look into this. But I'm going to read the beginning of this because you guys know me. I tend to elaborate a little bit, being a woman and liking words. So um, I'm going to try to read this to get a little bit farther down. And we may take a break if it's needed. So Mark, if I'm focused on what I'm doing, just holler if we need to take a break. Before we get to the end, I have not given all this before, so I don't know how long it's going to take to get to the end. But... Um, how many of you are, have been watching the weather and you get an update with the weather watch? Have you ever seen that? Little thing scrolls across the bottom. You may be going up there. If you click that again, you'll have a, a watch go across the bottom there. But, and then there are warnings. A watch is issued when the things are developing that could be, say that could be, that could be favorable for certain events to take place. A warning is issued when certain events have been confirmed and are now certain. So what we're doing today is issuing a watch. And if you are a watchman, if I hope you are because Yeshua yes. commanded us to be that in the right. days that we live in especially. And if you are watching, how many of you know it helps to know what you're watching for? Yes? yes so um, there's some things that the Holy Spirit has just brought to my attention and confirms over and over again this week. And so we're going to be sharing a watch this is not a warning. These things have not solidified or come together in solid form yet. All right? But these are some things that we need to know about. There are certain developments happening in our world today that most, as per my conversations, even with the body of Messiah, do not have a watch on. The funny thing about it, you know, God likes to mess with you a little bit. And for my birthday this year, which was in September, Mark asked me what I wanted, and he had just gotten a new watch that didn't need batteries. It was a citizen watch, and it has an echo drive, and it runs on light. And so I said, you know, I think I would like one of those watches. And so Mark went and got me one. And you know, when you're prophetic, everything's prophetic. But the cool thing is it's a citizen. And when I opened it up, the Holy Spirit said to me, congratulations, you're a citizen of the heavenly kingdom. You run on light, and you echo what your father says. <laughs> so we'll see. What happens with that? But we're talking about watches today, so I just had to throw that in. Because um, most people that I talk to in the body of Christ, there's some wonderful ministry friends of ours that you know we talk to and we say, hey, <coughs> excuse me, have you guys heard about this? Have you heard about that? And I'm like, no. And you know, it's just, it's amazing um, to be plugged in with what God does. But we all have a piece of the puzzle, amen? Yeah. And we learn things from them and they learn things from us. But we need to be watching for these things because if you don't have a watch on, then you don't know what time it is. Correct? In the natural. If you don't have your watch on in the spirit, 
then you will not know what time it is. And as Mark has preached in this house, the Pharisees were reprimanded by Yeshua as being a hypocrite because they could look at the sky and say, oh, look, it's going to rain tomorrow, but they couldn't recognize the Son of God standing in front of them. So we need to not only have our natural watch on so we know naturally what time it is, but we also need to have our spiritual watch on so we will know what time it is. And if you don't know what time it is, then you do not live your days appropriately. If you don't know what time it is, you might just show up somewhere you're supposed to be at any time. You might not show up at work on time. You might try to eat lunch at 3 a.m. in the morning if you don't know what time it is. So part of the significance of the prophetic watchman in this season, and there's a plethora out there that God is just having sound the alarm everywhere, is that if you know what time it is, what should be our response if we have ears to hear and softened hearts to his voice is it causes us to live right. It causes us to say, oh, maybe I should mark these things off my calendar and I need to make these things a priority in this season. You know, last year the word in this house was um, from Isaiah that says, secret yourself, hide yourself in your room and shut the door until the time of my displeasure is past. And that is still a standing word for this season. <laughs> We need to be shutting ourselves away with Father and, and, and hiding ourselves in Him for this season. This is a season to be humbling ourselves under His hand, as we sang this morning, or this afternoon. I'll get that right some here. In worship. It is a time to live wise and not unwisely. It is my intention today to focus our attention on some of the events, say some, so. If I sit here and talk about everything happening in the world today, then we would be here probably all week, plus it would be impossible. Uh -huh. But I'm going to talk about some of the events today the Holy Spirit has highlighted to me that's happening in our world in the hope that we will live out this scripture. This is Luke chapter 21, verses 34 through 36. I have it written out. It says this. This is Yeshua, Sermon on the Mount, uh, or ser sorry, Sermon on the Mount of Olives, speaking about the days that we are living in. Oh. And take heed. Say that with me. And take heed. Take, take heed. Do you know what that means? Deal with your heart. Oh. Deal with your heart. Denise, when you let God deal with that anxiety and that fear in you, you are able to do things that in the past you might not be able to do. And as we all in this season let God deal with our heart, we're going to be able to do things that maybe in the past we've not been able to do. And take heed. What does that mean? Deal with your heart issues. And, and then he says, heed to yourselves. Somebody say yourselves. yourselves. I know this is prophetic. It's a little bit future yet. But I'm telling you, the time of necessarily, and I know this sounds, it's hard to hear. And it's hard to say. But there's coming a time in the scripture, it says in Ezekiel, that even though Job and Daniel, and I think it was one other prophet, I think it was Noah, was in a city, they said because of the, the trauma or the judgment that was going to come upon the land, only them, only they could save themselves. They could not save their children. Can you hear that? And I'm telling you, there's coming a time shortly where it is going to be about let no man take your crown. And yes, that doesn't mean we don't pray for one another, we don't stand for one another, we do. But I'm telling you, this is a season, and Yeshua was as a prophet stating in here, He to yourselves. If you'll get free, if you'll get delivered, if you'll let God oh. deal with your heart issues, it will affect the people around you. He to yourselves. And let me start over and take heed. He to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down by gluttony. That is not just overeating. That is the overindulgence of pleasures in this world. Too many guys can give you the stats on the latest football game, but they can't tell you what God is doing in the earth. And I'm not just picking on football. But we can't be absorbed into the pleasures of the world in this time and this season. If we are, we can miss what God is doing. He says, he to yourself lets your hearts be weighed down by gluttony. Lest they be weighed down by drunkenness. What is drunkenness? It is the dulling of our senses to the spirit of Jehovah. We're so drunk with the things of this world. With the junk food of this world. With the TV shows. Who's the greatest star? Who's the greatest dancer? Who's the greatest singer? Who's the American Idol now? We're so drunk with all these things that we can't hear the voice of God speaking to us. We have to be contrasted with that as Paul said. We have 
to be soberly minded. As God speaks to us and God shows us and God tells us the things that we need to know and we need to do in this season. And then he says, and, and lest your hearts be weighed down by gladly or drunkenness. And then it says the worries of this life. Everybody say worries. Worry. That, what is that? It's focused mostly on the temporal. The oh. things we worry about, 95% of them never happen anyway. Can I hear a yes? Okay? Fear, 95% of it never happens. When you start a sentence with what if, that means it's a fearful thought. 95% of that never happens anyway. It's wasted emotional energy. I've had to learn that the hard way in my life. But the worries of this life, that means focus on the temporary. We have to get that drunkenness, that gluttony, that um, focus on the worries and the temporary thing in our lives out of us. And then he says, and that day would come on you suddenly. Now that day is a key phrase. It's a Hebrew idiom. If you have a Hebrew mindset and you hear someone say that day, you know that Joel was the first prophet who prophesied about that day being the day of Yehovah. The day when God interrupts the plans of men and the plans of kings and the plans of nations and he brings atonement and restoration to this earth. And that day come on you suddenly for it shall come as a snare on all those dwelling on the face of all the earth. If you're part of all those dwelling on all the earth today, would you raise your hand? We're a part of the all. You know, so many people hear about things happening on the earth and they're like, wait, where can I go? I know people who've been in the military who know things we don't know that have left this nation and gone to South America and Central America and bought places to live because they know what's coming up on the earth. I have news for them. If they had read their scripture, there is only one place to hide and they find it in Messiah. You find it in the covenant. You find it in Psalms when David said, in times of darkness and distress, run to the covenant. Cling to the covenant. Therein is our safety found. For it shall come as a snare on all the earth. What is a snare? A snare is simply a trap that when you're caught in it, you're stuck. There's a snare not just coming on Lebanon, Tennessee. There's a snare not just coming on America. There's a snare not just coming on Europe. There's a snare not just coming on Germany. There's a snare not just coming on any nation you can name. It's coming on the earth. If we're dwelling on it, we are going to be caught in the snare. We're going to be immovable, unchangeable. But Yeshua said this doesn't have to take you by surprise. But you do need to know what's coming. And his response is found in verse 36. We prayed it many times in this house. Watch. You may say watch. Watch. Watch then at all times and pray that you be counted worthy. This is a prayer we should be praying now. Pray that you would be counted worthy to escape all that is about to take place. Why? Because we are going to see a plethora of scriptures in the Old Testament in the days ahead. There are those that God has predestined to be deliverers and saviors in the time that are coming. And they are going to be escaping the wrath that is going to be poured out by the Antichrist system on this planet and they're going to be bringing deliverance and salvation to others. Right now it's a small group. It's a remnant. But it always has been. Watch them at all times and pray that you be counted worthy to escape all that is about to take place and to stand before the Son of man. What is coming? What is coming? What is coming upon all those dwelling on the face of all the earth? It is going to be glorious and it is going to be horrendous. It is going to be bright and shining and it is going to be the depths of darkness at the same time. The series, the Lord Deliverance that I'm about to teach is focused mostly on the glorious deliverers and that's why I wanted to go there. But we have found in witnessing to people about God in America, especially where there's so many false conversions and there's just mental ascension but no life change. Is that many times people, in fact, often every time, people need to hear the punishment of sin. Yea, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Yeshua, our Messiah. If you give someone the gift without them realizing the penalty of what they 
the deliverance. The series, The War of Deliverance, that I'm about to teach is focused mostly on the glorious deliverers. Who are they? We're going to see they are the mature sons of Abraham. Nimrod prophesied it. We're going to show it to you. We've talked about it before, but I don't know if you caught it. That are being invited. Say invited. invited. You today, if you're hearing this message, you are being invited to be a part of this group. You can need deliverance. Or you can be a deliverer. Oh. There's an invitation today. Many are called, but few are chosen because there's a qualification. I'm not talking about being saved. I'm talking about being a part of a remnant people that God is going to use in the glorious, horrendous last days to fulfill His purpose. The series, The War of Deliverance, that I'm about to teach is focused mostly on the glorious deliverers, that is the mature sons of Abraham, that are being invited, that are being tested right now, that are being proven right now, and in the days ahead will be separated into this mission of the Father. The administration of the culmination of the ages that we gloriously read about in Ephesians chapter 1, from the beginning he planned it, has been planned from the beginning of the world and will dwarf and put to shame all the works of the devil as usual. But today, the Holy Spirit has led me to remind us of what has been prophesied concerning the completion of this age. And from this view, we realize why deliverers will be needed in the days ahead. And again, I want to restate this. My intention today with this lesson is to focus our attention on some of the events happening in our world in the hope that we will awaken to live out the days we are living wisely. Appropriately ordering our days. Understanding our Father's timing and signpost. To be ready and at the door. Watchful for the Master's return. And also to possess the understanding of why deliverers have been destined by our Father in the season ahead. And the glory of it all. It is amazing. in the scripture to Obadiah. You guys read Obadiah a lot, don't you? I haven't been there lately myself. One chapter written mostly to the sons of Esau, the Edomites. A lot of people are down on Ishmael, but if you know your New Testament, Ishmael has a covenant with God. It's the sons of Esau, the sons of Edom in the end, that will prove to be the enemies of Israel. That's why Yeshua is appearing to many, many Arabs around the world and preaching the good news to them. Because as sons of Abraham, they do have a covenant with him. They're not necessarily the promised line, but we all can come into Messiah and be a part of the promised line. Uh -huh. Can I hear an amen? amen? Obadiah. What does the word Obadiah mean? It means worshiper of Jehovah. Oh, I like that. And I want to read Verses 15 through 18, and then in verse 21 of Obadiah. Now, Obadiah has just given this prophecy against the, the Edomites, the sons of Esau. And in verse 15, he's still talking along that line. It says, For the day of Jehovah is near upon some of the nations. No. How many? Oh. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reward shall come back on your own head. Now that is true whether you're a son of Esau or a son of Abraham. If you reap, you will. If you sow, you will. Okay. Verse 16. For as you have drunk on my set-apart mountain, so do some of the nations. All of the nations drink continually. Notice the imagery here of Revelation 17, of the false religious church that is now ascending on this planet or rising up, that drinks from the goblet of the whore of Babylon, and in her drunkenness offers what they think is worship to God, simply using the name of Jesus 
for their own personal gain. And they shall drink and shall swallow and they shall be as though they have never been. Now that's the, that's the judgment of God coming. But look at verse 17. All through the prophets, it's hidden all in here. They prophesy the judgment of the latter day. All the latter day nation judgments are already prophesied. It's already in our scriptures. We're going to be looking at them. But there is a group that is also prophesied. It is our hope. Look at verse 17. Everybody say but. Wow. If you have a but today, say amen. Amen. All right. Verse 17. But on Mount Zion, which means burnt place. But on Mount Zion, there shall be an escape. And they shall be set apart. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions, their inheritance that God has given to us. Verse 18, and the house of Jacob shall be fire, and the house of Joseph, we're going to be studying that, will be a flame. But the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall burn among them, and they shall consume them, so that no survivor is left of the house of Esau, for Jehovah has spoken. Now let's jump down to verse 21. It says, and saviors or deliverers shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau, and the rain shall belong to Jehovah. Now here again, we see all nations are going to be a part of this. When we talked about this last time I taught, that in Romans chapter 11, the chapter where Paul is teaching about the wild olive branches, any wild olive branches in here today, shout hallelujah. And the natural born, that was pretty weak, but anyway, the natural born olive branches. Maybe you're not an olive branch, but there's only two choices, wild olive or natural olive. If you're a fig tree, or that might work, but if you're an orange tree, won't work, okay? You've got to be a part of this olive tree. He talks about all Israel coming together in the end time and being saved. And he talks about that as being the completeness of the nations has come in in Romans 11. When you couple that with Luke chapter 21, 24, it says, And Jerusalem shall be trampled underfoot by the nations until the times of the nations are filled. Now I want to talk to you about this just a moment. All nations are entering into this. The predestination, prophetic destiny of every nation has ever been has already been declared by Yahweh. We're all coming into that. The time of the completion and the fulfillment of the nations. That's why there's troubling in the nations right now. When I woke up this morning, Holy Spirit was talking to me about this some more. And he said, and this was my table when he was ministering to me, that in scripture. We find that there will always be nations. They're never going to be done away with. In Revelation 22, verse 2 or 3, the last chapter in the Bible, it says that the leaves of the tree of life are going to be the healing of the nations. So nations are always going to be a part of what God does on this planet. But listen to this. But the nations will not always be what and how they are now. Yeah. Right. Can you see the difference in that? On, Neville Johnson has had an encounter with God where he's taken him into the future and showed him a part of the millennial reign. In that millennial reign, out in the Pacific Ocean, there was a land mass that came up because every mountain is going to be humbled and every uh, valley is going to be exalted. There was a land mass that came up in a whole other country in that place. God has prophesied in this house, this nation is going to go through trouble, but he's yeah. going to judge the evil seed in this nation. Oh. The covenant seed in this nation is going to come forth, but this nation is going to be renamed. There are many nations in the millennial reign that will be renamed. And the unrighteous, bloody workings of men through the ages oh. that have stolen land, that has oh. claimed land in a wrong existence, they're going to be renamed and rightly alone. By God. What do you think the first fruits of that is when Abraham or when Joshua led the descendants into the promised land and named by God? That's not the end. That's the beginning of what God is going to do. So nations are always going to be here, but the nations will not always be what and how they are now. We are entering the time of the completeness of the nations. Or the times of these nations being fulfilled. I want to 
say that again. We are entering into the time of the completeness of nations. Romans chapter 11. Or you could rephrase it, Luke 21, 24. The times of these nations as we know them being fulfilled. Remember the Hebrew way of looking at prophecy. Filled, 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 fulfilled. We're coming into the fullness of that. In these days, when the world is focusing on nationalism versus globalism, how many of you heard that recently? Yeah. Vote for this candidate because he's a national candidate. Look at Europe. Ooh, they broke out of the European Union and they're now more nationalistic. They're owning their national identity. This is a relevant subject because this thing is not going to stop here. But we as believers, saints, set upon ones in our generation cannot be like the man who is short-sighted and does not have the Spirit of God in them and are just saying, I don't want globalism, but they're wanting nationalism, not realizing the time and the season that we're living in is the fullness of the nations, is the completeness of the nations, and the nations as we know them are about to be judged by God, cleaned up by God, and taught by God, and reordered by God. So yes, there's nationalistic Fervor, but there are so many in this nation that have worshipped at the idol of America. That is not our Savior. A candidate is not our Savior. That's right. Come on. In these days, when the world is focusing on nationalism versus globalism, both present circumstances are temporary. Thank God Almighty, globalism, Nimrod's rebirth in the last days of one world religion, one church, world, one economy, mark of the beast. It is temporary. Listen, the, the, the battle of Armageddon is one hour. Oh my goodness, seriously. But the reign of Jehovah Messiah is coming and coming and coming at the increase of his government. There will be no end. Yeah. And we've got a little bit of that. We want a little bit of that. Globalism is temporary. But we need to understand, lest we be caught up in the chatter of the day, that nationalism is also coming to its end. Come on. And you best be prepared for that in your heart, or you might be offended at what God does in the earth. <laughs> Both present circumstances are temporary. It is important to have God's perspective of the nations. What is that? This is God's perspective of the nations. A drop in the bucket. That's it right there. America. Russia. That's it. Because he knows they're coming and going. Nations have come and have gone. There are nations that have existed. You can't find them anymore. Hello. Come on. American Christians. How about New Jerusalem Christians? Let's focus on what we need to be focusing on. Now, am I saying unplug from what's happening currently in our nation? Absolutely not. But I'm saying don't approach it short-sightedly. Because you have an opportunity in the people that you talk to to say, well, don't you know that America is coming to an end anyway? And his reign is right, coming? And he's going to judge the evil of this nation. It is important to have God's perspective of the nations that are as a drop in the bucket. If not, in the days ahead, you may find yourself fighting against Yehovah. Why do I say that? Has anybody ever heard of the guy Apostle Paul? He was short-sighted in his generation, but very zealous for God. He loved God and believed he was serving him with all his heart. He was a Pharisee, but he was not of serpent seed. Because if he was, he could not have heard, he could not have repented, and God would not have used him. So here's this man, religious, zealous, loving God in his generation. But God changed the game plan. He was among the blind Pharisees, and he didn't know it. He said in the blind Pharisee message churches, and he didn't hear the message to awaken him. He didn't hear, oh. go out in the wilderness to the little guy in the camel hair eating locusts, saying, behold, the Lamb of God. He wasn't there 
that day he missed the sermon. So what did he do? He persecuted the then move of Yahweh in the earth. But what did God do about it? He knocked him off his high horse. He revealed himself to him and got him in the flow of God. I'm telling you, don't be short-sighted about what God is doing in the earth. Paul thought that Saul thought that was it. This is what God's doing. God changed. He prophesied it, but he hung out with the blind. He was blind. So what did God do? He made him blind so he could see. Thank you. In his zealousness, the apostle saw of his of the past season of God. And I don't I know there's some people in here, and I'm just praying for myself also. Please let go of the past season. Wow. And you may be in this assembly and think, oh my Lord, how can you think I'm sitting in here and holding on to the past season? Look what we've changed. Look what we've gone through. Yes, hallelujah, we have gone through the change, Woo. but we're not through yet. Let go of the past season, or you may find yourself persecuting the present move. Because Yeshua had to change his paradigm to show him that. I talked about this at the conference in Isaiah, chapter 4, verse 2, about the, 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 the escaped ones that are going to come out of all nations in the days ahead. But I want to look at one other scripture here. I want to look at Joel, chapter 2. Now you guys know Joel. You know chapter 2, hopefully. You know, the day of Pentecost wasn't the day, it was the feast when uh, Peter stood up and preached as a new man with the laws of Jehovah now written on his heart, immersed into Holy Spirit, immersed into Father, immersed into Yeshua. And as a new immersed man, he preached and he said, this is that which was prophesied. This is not, oh, don't know about this. This isn't in our Old Testament. No, it's all here. This is what Joel prophesied. Let's look here at Joel chapter 2. Let's just start reading in uh, verse 27. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am Jehovah, your Elohim, and there is no one else, and my people shall never be put to shame. Verse 28. And after this, all these things that he's talking about, and we won't get into what chapter 2 is about, but... Um, Acts chapter 2 was the kickoff to this. We're living in the touchdown part of this. And after this it shall be that I pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men dream dreams. And your young men see visions. This doesn't mean exclusively. This just means across the gamut. Everyone is going to be able to hear and see God and be directed in that time. And also on the male servants and on the female servants I shall pour out my spirit in those days. Now notice this, verse 30. This is quoted again in Acts. And I shall give signs in the heavens. Say in the heavens. And upon the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun is turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Notice again, it's dealing with the heavens before. Say before. The coming of the great and awesome day of Yahweh. Now, this is not the lead up to that time, but this is when he dramatically intervenes in the plans of evil kings and nations conspiring against him and begins the atoning and cleansing that we see through the trumpets and the vile judgments in the book of Revelation. Verse 32, And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name not of just Lord, it's not Krishna, it's not Muhammad, it's not just Master, but anyone who calls upon the name of Yehovah, the revealed name of God, the covenant name of God, shall be delivered. For on Mount Zion, in Jerusalem, there shall be what? An escape. And Yehovah has said, and among the survivors whom Yehovah calls, and as I said in Isaiah chapter 4, during the conference we looked at, upon Mount Zion and her assemblies, there shall be a glory dome or covering in those days. Upon the survivors and the remnants. Now notice the focus here. It's on all the earth. 
could just sit out, put a cloth on the ground, and just look up at the stars. At that strand in that Milky Way. You just look up there. You can't see it in our house because of the light pollution. And we just lay there and we looked and they're talking to us. We got out our little iPhones and we put in our star app and we looked up and said, oh, there's Venus. Woohoo! You know, oh, look, there's Jupiter. We're going to be talking about a little more. I've introduced it to you already. You may already know about it, what Jupiter's about to do in the heavens. It was written by God before it was ever put there for this day and this time. You see, sometimes, and I know this from Pastor Steve of Discovery Ministries, sometimes when we start to understand how miracles happen, we tend to discount the fact that it's a miracle. But the miracle is in the timing of God that it was preordained and set up by God in the first place. Example, by science and understanding of technology's development, we now know a lot about how a baby is formed in a mother's womb. But just because we know that, it doesn't make it less of a miracle when God knits that little one together in his mother's womb. Yes? But it's in the timing and the predestination and the purpose of the life-breathing spirit of God in that environment. Well, so are these events. As we begin to look at them and understand how they're unfolding, it does not make them less of a miracle to understand them. The miracle is in understanding the timing that God has preordained and established. These things from the beginning to be there. The heavens are proclaiming the glory of God and the expanse is declaring the work of His hand. Day to day, they're talking to us. They're pouring forth speech. Night to night, they are revealing knowledge to us. There is no speech and there are no words where His voice is not heard. And then Genesis 1.14, And God said, Let lights come to be in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs. Say signs. Signs. And let them be for appointed times. Moab, that means feast. Let them be for appointed times. Say appointed times. Oh and let them be for days and for years. You see, from the spring feast, we have understanding of the days. It starts the, the months for us. And from the months come the days. But the fall feast, we have understanding of years. We just went through the fall feast and the year changed. 57, 77. So presently there are some signs occurring in the heavenlies. The Father has been drawing my attention and a lot of people too as watchmen. And they tie very much into the topic that we're about to delve into as a congregation about the deliverers and saviors that are going to escape that which is about to come up on this earth and deliver and save others. Preparing the bride for Yeshua to come. Now let's look at Luke chapter 21 and let's get into some of these. Verse 31. Luke 21, 31. Again, this is the Olivet Discord, Discourse written and recorded for us in Luke's version. Chapter 21, verse 31. It says, so you also, when you see these matters take place, know that the reign of Elohim is near. Truly I say to you, this generation, is talking about seeing Israel reborn, shall by no means pass away till all has taken place. The heaven and the earth shall pass away, but my word shall by no means pass away. Yeah, turn to, this should be Mark 13. I get it didn't change that. Thank you. Not Luke, but Mark's account. That'll fix our problem here. Mark 13. Sorry about that. That was good too, but. 
Mark chapter 21, no, what it is, Mark chapter 13, verse 31. Are we all together? Mark 13, 31. And the heavens and the earth shall pass away. This is the same thing as Mark's version. But my words shall by no means pass away. Now verse 32. But concerning that day and the hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father knows. Now, a lot of people take this verse and they say, see, we can't know when God's doing what He's doing because Yeshua and the Father and the angels don't even know. How many of you ever heard that? If you don't have the understanding of the Hebrew idioms in this verse, you totally miss what He's saying. And again, let's back up here and look at this. Verse 32, but concerning that day. Now, remember that day was started by Joel as a reference to the day of Yehovah. All right? Now, this is all in succession here. He says, but concerning that day, which is the day of Yehovah, which we represent and rehearse on the day of atonement. So if you have a Hebrew mindset, you will know that on some day of atonement, the day of Yehovah, the fullness of it is coming to this planet. So it says, but concerning that day and the hour no one knows. Again, it's a Hebrew idiom. Because the way Yom Teruah was celebrated with the watchers on the wall watching for the sliver of the new moon, they would sound the shofars and then people would have to run to the temple and shut the doors. If they didn't make it, they didn't get in. That's why Matthew 25, Yeshua said ways into the wise and unwise virgins. In the Hebrew mind, it makes sense. But we've been Hellenized and we don't have that understanding. So let's get the Hellenization out of us and realize that God is just so awesome he is so magnificent that He can actually tell us when what is going to happen as surely as Yeshua was killed on Passover at the exact moment the Passover lamb was slain. He is going to fulfill the fullness of the fall feast. Right. And He is saying here concerning that day, if you have a Hebrew mindset, you understand it all. He's talking about the, the day of Yahweh. He's talking about the fulfillment of the day of atonement for the nations. For the planet. And he's talking about the hour that no man knows. Again, a Hebrew read it. Found in Matthew 24. Segways into Matthew 25. But concerning the day and the hour. So concerning the Yom Teruah. The, 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 the Feast of Trumpets. Concerning the Day of Atonement. The final fulfillment of that. The angels in heaven or the Son or the Father knows which one it's going to happen on. But he goes on and he says, but take ye, watch and pray. And I say, watch. For you do not know when the time is exactly on that day when it's going to happen. As he says here in the next verse. And this man going abroad, having left his house and given authority to his servants and to end his word and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Say, watch. Watch. Verse 35, say, watch. Therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. You don't know what season. You don't know what. No, notice what he says. You do not know if it's in the evening. You do not know if it's at midnight. And you do not know if it's at the crowing of the cock. Crop, cock. What is that? But when I call the priests to the temple in the morning, it's not a rooster in Jerusalem. And you don't know if it's going to happen in the morning. When? Of that day. Or the day that no man knows. Verse 36, last coming suddenly, he should find you. You see it in service all the time. <laughs> find you unaware. What's tell me the timing of God? Oh, I don't know. When did Yeshua resurrect? I think it was Easter. When was Jesus born? It was Christmas. It was on the Antichrist's birthday. <laughs> Nimrod's birthday. Let's celebrate that. That's what the Antichrist spirit does. Daniel prophesied it changes the times and seasons. We've been hoodwinked. Uh -huh. And some of us that heard it still can't believe it. Because uh -huh. everybody else does it. Uh -huh. Well, go with the four billion in Israel. I'm going to stand over here with Joshua and Caleb and Moses and, and, uh -huh. and Aaron. Uh -huh. It's four against four billion, but hey, I'll take those odds with Jehovah on our side. This isn't something I just say. This is life to me now. This is who my father is. And I'm, I'm responsible to whether you believe it or not believe it. But I am going to get in your face. 
choice. It's that if you're not aware of it and living it and walking in the covenant and you're living your life based on someone else's words called Papa Francis or Papa Pope, and you calling him Papa, and you're doing what they said, this is the day. You see, it's like what Mark said Wednesday night when um, the guy in the conference that changed the name of his ministry. When Dr. Lake was here, I mean, you talk about a rare breed to find one some so educated with so many alphabet letters beyond their name. But they can hear the truth and react to it. There are people worshiping tomorrow morning in a Sunday church that have never heard the truths that have been preached in this place. God is going to consider that in the days ahead. But those that have heard the truths and have chosen to be hoodwinked by Babylon and stay in the system, them I am concerned for. Because if you have a heart for truth, I didn't know it. I practiced Catholicism as a Protestant for 50 years of my life. And it wasn't until I kept seeking God as we all did and God brought truth to me on that level. When I heard the truth, I was able to change. Yeshua could easily identify the seeds of people that he talked to by if they could hear what he said. He would speak to them the truth that he said, but you can't hear it because you're not of my father. Right. Or many of us have been so hooed by Babylon by the Masonic control of the Protestant churches in our city. Oh, 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 I mean, oh. I'm just telling you, the Protestant churches in this city are run by the Masons. If I was saved in it and baptized in it, and if I think I didn't have it in me, then I was crazy. But God had me pray off the Masonic hoodwinking and blinding of being birthed in that religious system. And as I did, more and more truth began to come my way. Some have been raised in Catholicism, and you wonder why you doubt continually. Because Catholicism puts spirits of doubt on people where they hear truth, but they can't respond. Simply repent for that Catholicism and that Romanism that you were born into and ask for God to remove the blinders placed on you from that system and you'll be able to hear truth and respond. Hallelujah. It's not about not knowing. God's not going to judge you for something you didn't know. But when you hear truth, can you respond to it? Come on. That's what Good. is important. And yes, when I first heard this stuff, I had to stop. I had to process it. I had to research it. I had to own it. I wasn't going to just change my life and turn it upside down on the whim of somebody on YouTube. Hello? Yeah. But as I began to press in and research and get in the Word and talk to Father about it, the truth of it was so apparent. We have to be, as Mark said Wednesday night, quick to respond. But here, he says there's going to be some that are going to be sleeping. I was reminded this week when Yeshua rose from the dead, his own disciples didn't even believe in him. Oh. And Mark has said many times over our ministry, most people are not going to believe a lot of what we say until we resurrect, spiritually speaking. Right now, we're still in the dying mode. And I'm just about dead. I still have a few tender spots if you pray me, but <laughs> pretty well dead. I enjoy it, Dad, actually. But there are four commands to be watchers, four commands to be at the door and to be watching. You have two options in this passage. You can be, let's, let's see what the talking heads are saying on the hundred million channels that they put before us. Or let's be at the door watching. Is Yeshua coming? Where's the feast? What's the timing of my father? What's he doing in this time? What's he doing in this season? I didn't say it. He said it four times. Watch. Yeah. Watch what? In the Mount Olivet Discourse found in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, and other plethora of scriptures in the Old and New Testament. But in those three passages, Yeshua himself gives a list of signs that we are to be watching for. And we're going to go through some of